Well, hello, David. This is book two in your trilogy of historical fiction novels involving Thomas Edison and some other notable real life characters interspersed with some fictional ones. I think one thing readers new to the series might find surprising is that at the beginning of book two, the namesake of the series, the franchise, Thomas Edison is dead. So maybe you can bring us up to speed and give us a brief synopsis of what's happening in the narrative at this point and what has happened to Edison in 1933. Well, John, when I began plotting the elements of Thomas Edison and the Purgatory Equation, in book one in the trilogy, the timeline of the winter of 1918 was easily arrived at for two key reasons. The impending entrance of the United States into World War I, and the mysterious fact that Edison literally disappeared for the entire month of February. Now, years later, it was claimed that Edison spent the month in Key West, but since even that explanation is suspect, I decided to send him on to an expedition to purgatory. Book two was more problematic because the best timeline was 1933. And now the only problem was that Edison died in 1931. So how could I bring him back? Thankfully, once again, history stepped in and showed me the way. Of course, 15 years later, things have changed. The United States remains mired in the depths of the Depression. The new president, Franklin Roosevelt, is trying to resurrect the country with a mix of capitalism and socialism, every ism really, except fascism. Fascism is the province of Germany and Italy as personified by their new leaders, Benito Mussolini and Adolf Hitler. As for the returning characters from book one, well, they're older. John Dawkins, Edison's heroic assistant, is no longer a boy of 22, but a man in his mid-30s. Gershwin is no longer a teenage piano player, but a renowned composer. Emily Auburn, the Ziegfeld Folly showgirl who was the love of John's life, remains long dead. And now, so is Edison. Or is he? Has he created a new invention to resurrect himself one last time? Well, the title is Thomas Edison and the Lazarus Vessel, but you'll have to read the book to find out. In this book, David, Edison's research into rubber plays a major role. Was the real Edison that interested in rubber? He was. Edison was fascinated by the untapped properties of rubber. And that fascination lasted throughout the final 15 years of his life. Now, the genesis of his interest is based in fact. At the end of World War I, Edison was approached by two of his close friends, Henry Ford and Harvey Firestone. Both men were greatly concerned that during the war, the United States had been forced to rely on unstable foreign countries for the amount and quality of rubber necessary to mount a solid defense. They urged Edison to apply his talents to create an enhanced hybridization of rubber that could be produced quickly, economically, and domestically. Edison accepted the challenge and spent the next nine years testing some 17,000 plant samples to gauge the quality and quantity of rubber that could be produced. And he finally hit upon the optimum combination, the banyan tree, which produced the milky sap of latex, and goldenrod, a common wildflower that through hybridization could provide an astonishing 12% yield of rubber. Edison was too successful. He believed his formula could create rubberized products with a active use lifespan of 20 years or more. Unfortunately, this did not jive with the tire industry's cardinal rule of planned obsolescence. Edison was gently advised to declare success and quit. Except, in my novel, Edison accidentally discovers a new invention, the semidermis, a manufactured vessel, vessel of skin that can house a soul and allow the dead to walk again. So the rubber hits the road, literally. 
David, one of the most vivid characters in book two, to me, is Eleanor Roosevelt. Mm. Uh, at one point, you have her performing an improvised comedy routine on stage with Groucho Marx. Right. Uh, tell us about the Eleanor Roosevelt you portray here and her resemblance to the real one. And, and what got you interested in the former first lady? Well, you know, in the novel, Groucho Marx is surprised to discover that Eleanor Roosevelt, as an onstage straight woman, is a natural. And that applies not only to comedy, but to her work as first lady, because there was no straighter arrow than Eleanor during the Roosevelt years. She was a tireless advocate for human rights, civil rights, child welfare, housing reform, and equal rights for women. She also understood that the one thing people feared most was change. And as first lady, she was an agent for change and a target of ridicule and anger. You know, her dowdy appearance, her school mom demeanor, her teeth. She didn't let it stop her. She famously stated, I am my husband's legs, as she traveled from here to there to everywhere, trying to set things right and fight the good fight. Of course, the, uh, the Eleanor in the novel is 80% defender of justice, 20% Carol Burnett. And while her unlikely chemistry with Groucho is completely fictional, they suit each other to a T. Groucho shows her how to lighten up and laugh at herself, and Eleanor helps him understand that his humor is far more potent when he uses it to stand up for what's right instead of merely poking fun. They make for a memorable comedy team. Indeed they do. Uh, speaking of Eleanor, David, her husband, Franklin Roosevelt, is also a major character. And in one of the book's scarier subplots, you have FDR locked in a battle with a corporate cabal of business tycoons planning to take over the U.S. government. How much of this is true? Well, the, the backstory of the book centers on a proposed uh, business coup against the government during the first year of Roosevelt's administration. There was a bruised hatred from the ruling class for the president because he was one of their own. And while he'd campaigned on providing all Americans with a new deal, the business combines of the country preferred the same old deal, or better yet, an ironclad marriage between government and industry that was proving to be a lucrative new form of fascism in countries like Italy and Germany. How much of this is true? Shockingly, almost all of it. Now, granted, I've created a fictional ringleader and I've established some motives and methods purely to serve the storyline. But the only reason we know about this forgotten piece of history is Major General Smedley Butler, who was chosen to be the front man for the coup, turned against the insurrectionist and blew the whistle on the whole treasonous plot. You know, throughout his 30 year career in the military, the general had done his duty by installing U.S. friendly strongmen in countries like Nicaragua, Haiti, the Dominican Republic, all to the benefit of the money interest on Wall Street. It was even said he made China safe for Standard Oil. Now, the plotters of the coup thought he'd be the perfect front man for their scheme, a beloved, respected patriot who was only motivated by love of country. However, they hadn't, counted on two, they hadn't counted on two things. The first was that Butler had sorrowfully come to the conclusion that war was a racket. And the second was that when it came to the United States of America, his only interest was in maintaining a democracy. How close did we come to an overthrow of the government? Too close. Does this sound familiar? So, David... Eleanor Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, Groucho Marx, these are people and names that readers will recognize. But another intriguing real life character in this book is Rudolf Hess, a, a real person, but perhaps not someone well remembered today. And yet he was a man who was a central character in one of the most shocking and bizarre real life episodes of World War II that you have managed to sort of work into your book. Can you tell us about it and about Hess's fate? Yeah, Hess was um, one of Hitler's oldest friends. 
and the two ascended through the ranks of the DAP, which later became the Nazi party. As Hitler consolidated power and surrounded himself with third-rate supplicants, Hess remained, if not quite his conscience, at least a leash on some of his more despicable aspirations. Now that all changed on May the 10th, 1941, when Hess stole a plane and flew from Germany on a secret solo mission to Scotland. Against all odds, he made it. But after that, history goes haywire. Was Hess on a peace mission or trying to escape? But who sent him or who sent for him? Now, this bombshell generated dozens of conspiracy theories that the only thing Winston Churchill and Adolf Hitler would agree on was that Hess had gone mad. It was a mutually convenient evasion. And both countries immediately disassociated themselves from his actions. In truth, Hitler was devastated. Of all his inner circle, Hess was the only one who had proved to be selflessly dedicated to the Fuhrer's well-being. Hess sought no glory or personal enrichment. So why? History has no definitive answer. However, I'm willing to venture a fictional one. Hess came to realize the diabolical scope of Hitler's final solution and the mysterious forces aiding him in his quest. But those revelations will be detailed in book three of the Edison trilogy. For now, we'll simply introduce the deputy Fuhrer as an official who was loyal to his country and to his old friend, but who realizes too late the infernal powers that have been set in motion against civilization. So Hess was clearly a complex and an interesting but serious character for you to write. Now, on the other side of the spectrum, how much fun was it to write jokes for your Groucho Marx character? And very important, do you think he would have laughed at them? <laughs> you know, I, I was seven years old the first time I saw the Marx Brothers. I was homesick from school with the chicken pox and I was watching some morning movie show. And I was in shock and in awe and in love. Groucho's sense of giddy anarchy rocked my small town Midwestern world. From that moment on, I sought out his movies, his uh, television series, his late in life interviews with the superb Dick Cavett, and was astounded by his incredible solo debut at Carnegie Hall at the age of 81. He remains one of the great iconic comedians now, I am not a professional historian, but I know my Groucho. As for writing jokes for the Groucho character, I, I knew it would be a challenge. And with one or two exceptions, I made it more difficult by not using the jokes he was famous for. However, the experience was also an honor and an absolute pleasure because it provided me with the opportunity to be in the company of Groucho by trying to think like Groucho. So, would he have laughed at the jokes I wrote for him? Probably not. He wasn't a laughing kind of comedian. He was a serious craftsman and appreciated the funny business from a, a strictly professional perspective. But if somehow, somewhere, he ever gets wind of the material I wrote for him, nods sharply and says, that'll like, believe you me, there's no higher praise. Well, David, we've talked about a lot of the historical figures that make appearances in the book, but there is another fascinating true life episode in history from 1933 involving a postage stamp that plays a role in your book. And apparently this all starts in Chicago. So maybe you can tell us a little more about that. Well, Chicago needed a makeover. It had become a cesspool of corrupt government and organized crime, so the city fathers decided to mount the World's Fair. Now, the day after uh, a $10 million bond was issued to fund the fair, the stock market crashed, almost assuring that the fair would be a financial bust. Two things saved it, a stripper and a stamp. The stripper was Sally Rand, a second-rate actress from Hollywood, who became a national sensation when she unveiled her notorious fan dance and performed an astonishing 17 shows a day. As for the stamp, 
It was commissioned by the U.S. Postal Service to commemorate the arrival at the fair of Germany's massive Graf Zeppelin. Now, the Graf had captured the imagination of the world, and the price of the ticket not only allowed fairgoers to view the Zeppelin in all its glory, but to purchase a roll of stamps, proving to friends and family alike that they'd witnessed the magnificent Graf in person. The stamps sold like gangbusters and helped put the fair in the black, an incredible achievement, especially during the middle of a depression. Now, those are the facts. Here's where fiction kicks in. Even the most innocent objects, a bath sponge, a dish towel, or even a stamp can be used as a weapon. Of course, the Zeppelin stamp wasn't really used as a weapon. But what if it had been? We've talked about this before, David, in our interview for the first book in the Edison trilogy, but I think it's a question worth asking again. Do you consider this science fiction, horror, historical fiction, history? Will fans of any of those genres or all of them appreciate the story that unfolds here? You know, when I'm asked, is your novel historical fiction or science fiction or fantasy or adventure, <laughs> my answer is all of the above. The Edison books are what is known in the trade as a genre mashup, where all of these categories, and sometimes even more, mix together to provide an entertainment. So hopefully the reader will be stimulated to learn more about the history they didn't know, thrilled to the fantastic exploits of Edison and his team, laugh with the comic relief, maybe shed a tear at tender or tragic moments, or be inspired by a truism of metaphysical faith that speaks to the soul. But the ultimate goal of all of this is for the reader to have one hell of a rollicking, rip-roaring read. You know, a review from um, Literary Titan for the first book in the trilogy, Thomas Edison and the Purgatory Equation, crowned it the popcorn movie of novels, unadulterated fun. And that was absolutely my intent. So get out the popcorn, fasten your seatbelts, and enjoy the ride.